Hello everyone, Merry Christmas, and I would like to also include Happy New Year and Happy Holidays. I'm Master Delpe, and today we'll focus on not only the uh, typical definition of Christmas or the typical experience of Christmas, we will also talk about the esoteric significance of uh, Christmas. And I hope I can deliver the message today, just given a few minutes of our time <clears throat> talking about uh, Christmas and its origin. And we will also follow it with the blessings so that we can include blessing our families, our loved ones, our uh, communities, and also our cities and countries. So I'd like to start by you closing your eyes with me and we invoke so it becomes more solemn and more guided and protected. Please close your eyes. We humbly invoke for divine protection, guidance, empowerment to celebrate uh, this special occasion we call the Yuletide or Christmas with the blessings of the Christ, the Lord Jesus the Christ, and all divine beings responsible for the initiation of humanity through Christianity and to the birth of Jesus the Christ, an avatar of the Piscean uh, era. Invoke also for the divine lineage of Jesus, which stems even from the Abrahamic religions, the Judaism, going to Christianity. We invoke all the divine lineages of masters and holy beings who prophesied and inspired the coming of Jesus the Christ as the Messiah or the Savior for our Piscean period. Whatever religion we belong to, it is not just the religious significance that we are invoking here, but the esoteric and the divine significance, the universal significance of Jesus as an avatar of Pisces. And the Messiah made flesh or made man as mentioned in the Bible or the scriptures. We invoke also the lineage of the holy masters, holy beings who are responsible for the coming incarnation of Jesus the Christ to bring also the higher significance of Christianity and Christmas to all of us and to the whole world and to the whole humanity. We salute the heavens, we salute the holy beings, we salute the divine creator, the divine God, the divine Rakhasim, the fountain of all life on the planet, for the blessings of the whole world today and humanity and all people who need help and blessings, those who are in despair, hopeless, sick, those who are afflicted with pain and suffering, may they be included as well. Those who do not even have food to eat today, those who do not have all the amenities to celebrate Christmas, may they all be blessed. Those who are suffering also because of the loss of loved ones, because of separation, because of conflicts and crises, and poor health, may they be blessed. With the Christian, Christian spirit of Christmas, which brings joy, jubilation, jubilation, and also peace. May all of us be blessed. May all our families be blessed. May our lineage be blessed with the 
higher aspect of Christmas and the wisdom of Christianity and Christmas, so it is. So it is. Open your eyes. <clears throat> All right, so we have a lot of uh, things to talk about in a very compressed time, and I have a tall order to uh, deliver today. I'm not a pastor, a priest, or a preacher, so I will have to make sure that what I will say will not be too Christian or too Catholic, at the same time not moving away much from Christianity. Well, I was born as a Catholic and educated by Christians, uh, missionaries from Europe, I grew up from uh, the only Catholic country before in the, the Southeast, the Philippines, the only citadel of Christianity in Asia. And I'd like to say that I was trained in this <clears throat> religion since I was uh, a kid and baptized and given all the sacraments, except, of course, the last sacraments, which is for death. But I also learned many religions which gives us the uh, idea that I have to use a little bit more universal connotations, labels, and uh, inspiration to give you a balanced point of view of the exoteric aspect of Christmas and the esoteric aspect and the exoteric balancing itself themselves. <clears throat> so I don't want to offend any religions or uh, desecrate any teachings. So I have to be very careful in pronouncing what I think or my, inter my interpretation about many things esoterically. And that is the hardest things to do, to not confuse you during Christmas of your faith as Christians, as Catholics, or non-Christians as well. At the same time, I have to give some light into what I think should be shared to you today in a gentle way about uh, the backgrounds of Christmas and also some of the maybe myths or some of the, I would say, controversies behind it. Mm -hmm. So it's not easy to, to start because I can talk very quickly about the Catholicism connotations about Christmas and Christianity. At the same time, my, my topic today is about the esoteric significance. So I'm caught in between how to deliver to Christians and how to also inspire you in looking deeper into uh, the essence of Chris Christmas. Well, most of us would remember Christmas as uh, the most expensive time of the year, right? And your pocket gets, you know, shallower and shallower as you buy things for your loved one. But it's also one of the merriest time of the year because uh, you give a lot of things to people, even to people who you do not sometimes know, like feeding the poor or street children. At the same time, it is uh, also a materialistic aspect of uh, the Western world, thinking of Christmas as uh, receiving only material gifts instead of sharing more lofty aspirations of life, like blessing people, inspiring people, and other uh, essence that comes from the heart and from the soul. So if you look at uh, the traffic going to your malls during Christmas, it's more than usual. And it's probably the highest sale in the United States to make them, you know, uh, profitable in, say, in different uh, malls. But at the same time, it is a time that people take vacations to meet their families. And sometimes it ends up to a dreaded vacation because when you drink a lot, you tend to, you know, discuss many things. And then it's out of bounds and people fight and... Uh, argue about things, even, you know, all old, old things. I know because uh, when I was younger, uh, everyone gathers around uh, your grandparents and parents and then celebrate Christmas as a tradition. And then you have to go and sing and, and knock on doors and sing Christmas carols and, uh, you know, receive gifts. So it's like a time for even kids to enjoy uh, sharing, receiving, giving. So that is like one of the commercial essence of Christmas. Expensive time to buy as many gifts, to share as many gifts to as many people. 
and also expecting sometimes that you receive something in return that's as expensive as you have given. And most often, sometimes you receive less expensive gifts than you have given, so you feel sometimes what's going on. <clears throat> so that is too commercial. Second significance is also a vacation where you feel, uh, I would say, the essence of the environment with a lot of lights. Christmas lanterns, Christmas lights, and all kinds of fantastic uh, lighting demonstration in homes, in your neighborhood, in commercial areas. Like that's the best time to look around at night because it's all well lit with decorations. And uh, also, uh, we equate this as the time for a lot of food and drinking. So that's like the side effects. Because most people will gain weight during Christmas and maybe their liver will become more toxic. Their blood becomes more toxic after drinking and eating a lot of uh, food that are not really totally healthy. But they said that it's just Christmas. So let's just enjoy, be merry, drink, have food, and who knows, you'll die in the New Year. So most people eat and drink a lot during Christmas. Today, our job is not about the commercial components and significance. We will talk more about the, uh, even a little bit of the roots of Christmas and also the esoteric significance. And Chris, Christianity and Christmas always rely on the stories from the Bible, stories of the Gospels, stories of the uh, epistles, all, all kinds of stories that were even coded as far as the Torah of Judaism from Isaiah or from Zachary, when uh, it was even prophesied even from the Jewish uh, tradition that the kingly uh, Messiah will also come in a, in a lowly uh, nature and riding a donkey. Yet there's a lot of conflict between the Ju Jewish uh, system and the Christian system in the sense of the Messiah has not come as far as the uh, Jewish tradition is concerned. They're still waiting for the Messiah. And uh, in terms of Christianity, the Messiah has arrived and already died for our sins and saved us, something like that. Now, if you look at the Western chronograph or chronological significance of A.D., Anno Domini, is the Lord, year of the Lord. I mean, to say that Christ was born on A.D. when you put the A.D. Anno Domini is the significance of the year of the Lord when Christ was born. That's why uh, the Western Hemisphere, and now in, in globally, we use A.D. as the demarcation line between Jesus' birth and before Jesus. But many scholars also had uh, contested many of these uh, proclamations because uh, by history, it was only the uh, governor of Syria who declared a census in Judea, the province of Judea, which Jerusalem and Bethlehem are inside of Judea, had a census. So this census by Quirinus, Quirinius, which is the Lord, uh, the uh, governor of Syria, was declared uh, to be only around 6 to 7 A.D., that's why if you look at the story of the Bible, uh, Mary and Joseph was in a, a difficult time when they have to go back to their hometown, Bethlehem. And that, just to, to uh, be accounted or to be surveyed by statistics for your hometown. So all the people have to go back to their hometowns for the census to be surveyed from your hometown. So there's a time they were trapped because, you see, all these commotions of surveys, all the inns and hotels at that time were filled up. So Mary and Joseph didn't have a place to stay, as the story goes. That's why they were forced to go to a farm where Jesus was born in a manger or in a stable, where only the meek animals were, uh, were present around because there were no more inns available during the census of Quirinus, the Lord, the governor of Syria, that they were forced to, to go to a farm, and uh, Mary at that time was uh, pregnant, and she delivered Jesus uh, during that time. 
but history dictates that this was taken around 6 to 7 AD. So it's like there's a lot of gaps in the declaration. Even scholars had also uh, calculated that the uh, birth of Jesus is uh, 8 AD. So you can imagine how much uh, difference is that 800 century. Because there was no really uh, somebody taking notes of calendars and, at the time. And uh, after that story, also the King Herod, which is the king of the Jews during that time in Judea, was appointed by the Romans. Remember that the, times, uh, the, the time of Jesus' birth was uh, controlled by the Roman Empire. So Judea was a territory <coughs> of the Roman Empire, even though that area was governed by many uh, rulers, including Persians and Syrians and all those people. It was the time of <clears throat> a Roman Empire that uh, Jesus was born, and also when Jesus was killed, I was uh, was uh, martyred with Pontius Pilate as the uh, ruler of the area through the Roman Empire. So most people talk about uh, Christmas as just a day of Jesus' birth, but when I look at it, it has to do with history. And most people even do not know that Jesus has a kingly birth because uh, Joseph, his father, was a lineage from the house of David. And the King David is a royal king. So anybody born of that line, even though a few hundreds of years or thousands after, it was a kingly, a royal line. So uh, people are expecting in that during that time a king with a crown to be born of a royal family, but they didn't know that it's more of a royal bloodline from the house of King David that uh, Joseph was, was uh, a lineage of that. So there's, there's a lot of uh, things that people still even in Christianity had to dig in and look at how Christianity was born through the birth of Jesus and what was going on at the time. <clears throat> what was going on at the time. So during the sixth ray or the sixth type of energy, which is the Piscean energy and the devotional energy was uh, pronounced, it was already affecting the time of Judea. In fact, it came a little bit before that, that the sixth ray was already uh, active, the Piscean energy. So that lineage has been, uh, I would say, empowered by the sixth ray energy. So that line of David, Solomon, all these lines, even from Abraham, starting to be empowered at that time of Jesus with the sixth ray or the sixth type of energy, which is devotion. And so... Uh, Esoterically, Jesus is the Lord of the Sixth Ray. Like he's responsible to manage the uh, downloading of the Sixth Ray devotion and abstract idealism, which is according to the Sixth Ray line, which is empowered by Pisces, the Pisces era. <clears throat> That's why persecution and martyrdom is the path of Christianity, including towards uh, Islam, because uh, Islam is an offshoot of Christianity, as Christianity was an offshoot of uh, Judaism. So there's a continuous line of that. So esoterically speaking, it is not by accident. It's not because he was born of a carpenter's uh, lineage. You see, the, uh, Joseph being the carpenter, even Catholicism, uh, brought him to be the pat this patron saint of the workers. Because uh, the connotation that carpenters are worker today is probably during the time of uh, Jesus. Carpenters are the architects, builders. If you can measure already and accurately build things, uh, you must be highly educated at the time or highly sophisticated to build homes, to build things. And I think... Uh, that royal blood of Joseph from King David had brought certain empowerment that is not seen today because 
in, in Christianity, we focus a lot on Jesus was born very poor because he's a son of a carpenter. So that word carpenter today is like belittled or, or talked down because a carpenter today is like somebody who just nailed things. But just go back in time. If you can already build and construct and measure accurately and you develop things, homes, just, you must be an advanced person at the time, like 2,000 years ago or more. So I will focus more on the esoteric component of the royal bloodline of Jesus through Joseph and King David, and from King David to Abraham. That's why if you look at Christianity, it's a cousin or sister religion of uh, Judaism. And Islam is a sister and cousin religion of Christianity and Judaism because they all point towards uh, Moses, and Moses points towards Abraham, and all of them points towards King Solomon and King David lines like that <clears throat> now without picturing that what happened in the olden times the g governors of Syria the rulers of Judea and all we are defending what we think of Judaism Christianity and versus Islam today we need to know the roots were the fertilization of the of the uh, faith or, or beliefs and uh, teachings because all of those teachings came from written manuscripts which were transcribed from um, papyrus papers, you know, papyrus. And these were extracted from Macedonia, Thessalonica, Egypt, like gathered by the Constantinople in the Turkey, that time, the Turkey. So Turkey was like the citadel, Macedonia, Turkey was Asia Minor, which is the city of Christianity at that time. That's why the Greek Orthodox Church was like one of the original holders of the faith of Christianity, because a lot of them were translated to Greeks, including the symbol of Jesus as the fish, which is at that time, a fish is a symbol equivalent to a savior. And if you study the symbology of Greek uh, letters, theta and all this, it points towards the fish. And of course, they took it as a fish. Jesus was a fish, which today also we look at is as Pisces. Whereas Christ symbol is the P and the X. See that difference between Jesus symbol and Christ symbol? Christ has a P and an X in Catholicism. For Jesus today, the symbol is the fish because the fish in Greek is a savior uh, word. All right, now, uh, for the sake of history, I'd like to read something that will be more concrete based on history so that we will not side whose religion is correct, Judaism or Christianity or Islam. So I want to avoid that today because I want to celebrate Christmas without confusion, contradiction. So I'd like just to point out by reading something written about the history of the area, including King Herod, which is the king of the Jews during that time in the Judea who had ordered after the birth of Jesus to kill the firstborn of every family so that the king of the Jews prophesied as Jesus will not take over his position because they interpreted that king of the Jews, Jesus, a saber, was to challenge him as a king of the Jews because his position at that time was king of the Jews. So imagine another person being born as the king of the Jews by prophecy. Therefore, you want to eliminate through oracles. They will prophesy that the king of the Jews will be born and, and replace him. So he ordered all the firstborns to be killed. So Joseph and Mary was forced to go to Egypt during that time from, from uh, Bethlehem. It's like a journey. So if you want, I can read what has been said history-wise history about uh, the history of the birth of Jesus in terms of the area, demographically, and the rulership during that time. Would you want me to give a little bit? Because most of you who are not Christians, or even those who are Christians, sometimes we do not bother to read history outside the Bible. But when you start to read something about history that is as, as, as far written as possible by 
historians, you will start to superimpose that knowledge with uh, your faith and your, your whatever it was told to you in your, your religion. And you will see that there's certain gray areas where you need to see where your faith and where is truth and where history uh, delineates. So I'd like to read, if you would be patient for a few minutes. Is it okay? I don't you want, usually want to read things, but today I'd like to read because I want to wash my hands from thinking that I'm explaining to you a Catholic perspective or a Christian perspective. Now, I don't want to read too many of the history of King David, King Solomon, but I'd like to read to you uh, the time of uh, the birth of Jesus from King Herod. Is this okay? All right. In the days of King Herod, this is not the gospel today, okay? This is just a reading from another history book. The country in which the Christian story started was a territory of the Roman Empire. Although the Romans were just the latest in a long succession of invaders. Just picture that. That that area before, there's a lot of invaders like India or other places like that. You know, after one, in fact, the Romans then came there, Persians then came many other uh, rulers. Jesus' birth, Bethlehem, and the surrounding region have an ancient history. Christ was born among the Jews who saw themselves as the chosen people of Jehovah. Jehovah is the uh, God name of the uh, tribes of, uh, of Jews, according to the scriptures. That's why there's a Jehovah Witness using still the old name of the Jews, the word Jehovah, the, the God of the Jews. However, the Holy Land that was so important to the Jews was one of the less significant corners of the world at the beginning of the first millennium. Judea and Israel, Judea is like the province. Judea and Israel, its neighbor to the north, so Israel is not Judea, had been bought have been brought together under King David from 1007 BC. So it's a thousand, between King David and Jesus, like almost a thousand years. The state he created with its capital in Jerusalem had come to prominence under his son Solomon in the 10th century BC. So uh, King Solomon is the lineage and then King, uh, King David came first in King Solomon after. Though known for his le legendary wisdom, Solomon had, an, in reality, all but ruined his kingdom. Now, this is a big blow to a lot of people who think that wisdom alone can, uh, can make a kingdom rise, which I will tell you a little bit of the Tibetan later on. So I, I repeat, though known for his legendary wisdom, Solomon had, in reality, all but ruined his kingdom. The construction of his celebrated temple had bankrupt the state. Eventually, the country disintegrated and was conquered by the Assyrians in 841 BC. You got that picture? I don't want to just read it. You need to see the graphics. King Solomon is noted for his wisdom. King David is known for his first ray energy that he uh, challenged Goliath and killed Goliath by a slingshot. But King Solomon was more noted for being a good judge to know who is the real mother of two, uh, one baby claimed by two mothers. Under occupation, the Jews never accepted their subject status despite being subjugated for centuries. First under the rule of the Assyrians, then the Babylonians, in the 6th century BC, leading Jews were taken from their country to the imperial capital in what is known as the Babylonian captivity. But this failed to break their spirit of resistance. So the Jews was also very resistant and very persistent. Persian power proved more benign. After conquering Babylon in 539, Cyrus, Cyrus the Great of Persia let the exiles return to Israel. He even ordered the reconstruction of the temple, this is the Temple of Solomon, which had been sacked by the Babylon, Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar after a Jewish uprising in 587, uh, 587 BC. 
The Persians, however, were swept aside by the eastward march of Alexander the Great, who came with his Greek army in 332 BC. Alexander the Great was uh, born in uh, Macedonia, which is uh, around uh, northeast of Thessalonica. When I was in Greece uh, a few months ago, uh, that was only around 60, I think, kilometers northeast and northwest of uh, Thessalonica. So now Macedonia includes uh, part north of Greece, part of Turkey, and part of, uh, uh, I think, Bulgaria. Like that. And even partly of Albania. So Alexander Great was uh, a conqueror that even went as far as uh, India. Fearlessly. So you, you look at uh, his, uh, his extent of power. After Alexander's death, his vast empire was over by his surviving generals, along with much of the Middle East. Israel fell to Seleucus, a boyhood friend and comrade at arms of Alexander. His descendants re reigned after him in what is known as the Seleucid line. Seleucid line. Attempts by the Seleucid ruler Antiochus IV to suppress the religious rituals of the Jews sparked a revolt in 167 BC. Simon Maccabeus, Hosmonian dynasty, took power and Jewish sovereignty was restored. Jewish rule lasted under oh, Jewish rule lasted un, until 63 BC, when the country was conquered once again, this time by the Roman general Pompey. Pompey is the rival of uh, Julius Caesar. Remember Cleopatra, Pompey, Mark Antony, those stories? was the same epoch where uh, Mark Antony's uh, group uh, betrayed uh, Louis, Julius Caesar and killed him. And both of them are rivals. And uh, uh, Pompey was a general, which is a friend of Julius Caesar, but then they fought each other in a power struggle. And then he was pushed to escape to Egypt and beheaded in Egypt as well. So both the generals who are like the rulers at the time, or dictators, were, uh, were killed by their own uh, lots. Anyway, uh, he let the Hasmoneans stay in office, but as a client king of what was known, now named as Judea, they reigned at the beck and call of the Roman emperors. But in return, their subjects could still find some comfort in the fact that their country was a kingdom rather than a mere province. That the Jews were allowed this degree of autonomy indicates the strength of their identity as a Jewish system. However, it also reflects the comparative irrelevance of a people living in on the margins. The main centers of wealth and civilization in the ancient world were to the east in Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq, and Persia. So in the olden times, Persia and Iraq already were really uh, modern and highly civilized and rich. More than Israel and modern Judea. Judea was like a poor area, fishing area. Okay, so I repeat. To the west of uh, the main centers of wealth and civilization in the ancient world were to the east in Mesopotamia, which is modern day Iraq and Persia and to the west in the Mediterranean. Palestine was peripheral to both these spheres. So Palestine in, in, in Israel was not a very significant uh, era at that time. It was Persia and Iraq. <coughs> Regardless, as insignificant as they were, the Jews had been allowed considerable freedom to live and worship God in the way they had for generations. This freedom was a dangerous thing. Many Jews were in no way reconciled to their subjection and were eager to shake off their Roman yoke. For the moment, Rome was firmly in charge and King Herod was the empire's servant. He had been appointed by the Romans as the king of Judea in 37 BC. So King Herod was the king during the time of Jesus' birth and was given the title king of the Jews. 
In return for his loyalty, Herod was Herod won certain privileges for the Jews, and the Romans made no objection to his requests. When in 19 BC he removed or he renovated the temple. I have one more page. The Jews had been expecting a mighty king as a savior, but instead Christ was born in a lowly stable in Bethlehem. So the birthplace is Bethlehem, but they call sometimes Jesus of Nazareth because that is where he grew up. See, okay, let's not confuse. Bethlehem is where he happened to be born because during the census of Quirinus, the uh, governor of Syria, there were no places to sleep because people are walking, uh, are moving from place to place to go back to their hometown. And so Mary and Joseph was walking towards their hometown and they just happened to just, there's no more place to, to be. And so they went to a farm area where the stable, the manger. So Jesus was born in a manger with just uh, like a stable. Jesus' scriptural tradition had long foreseen the coming of a Messiah, whom the book of Daniel, verse 9, 24, referred to as the anointed one or prince. See, even the Jewish tradition had prophesied the coming of the Messiah, according to Daniel's book. The people who live in darkness have seen a great light, prophesied Isaiah. As a king descended from the house of David, it was believed that the Messiah would introduce an eternal era of justice and peace. The word eternal era. Era is not forever, right? So if you interpret that, it is era is like Piscean era. Most Jews expected a king to come in glory, but there were Old Testament writers with another vision. Zacharias' Messiah was in business as lowly and riding in a, on a donkey. In a chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah is one of the writers of uh, the Christian faith as well as the Jewish. He's a very, very prominent uh, writer. There is a foreshadowing of how the Christian servant savior was received, despised and rejected by men. He was wounded for our transgressions and with his stripes we are healed. Now this is an important thing for non-Christians. How did uh, Mary uh, get appointed and, and initiated to be the mother of Jesus? So this part now you need to listen, especially non-Christians. A visit from an angel, which is usually what we call uh, Gabriel, Archangel Gabriel. Behold, a virgin shall conceive promises Isaiah. And bear a son and shall call him his name Emmanuel. That's why in Christianity, there's a song on Emmanuel. It's not just Jesus, but the word Emmanuel. So people would recognize where it came from. That prophecy found fulfillment in the gospel account, Luke chapter 1, in which the archangel Gabriel announced to the astonished Virgin Mary the miraculous part that she had been appointed to play, as the Messiah's mother. The angel's word were later to form the first line of the prayer that still repeated daily by many Catholics. The Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, and so forth. Hallowed be thy name according to, your, to the Annunciation. The angel also told Mary that her mother, much older relative Elizabeth was pregnant despite of years of childlessness. So the Blessed Virgin Mary went to see her in the visitation as a celebration. Uh, she had a, I think, cousin who was very, very old and no child. But the prophecy included that he, she will have a, a child, even though she was old and childless. So that was like a miracle also in the terms of the, uh, the Bible stories. Elizabeth greeted Mary in the words that came, that became the second line of the Hail Mary. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, thy womb, Jesus. Okay, now I would just uh, talk now about the nativity, or nativity is the, the birth. Mary, though a virgin, was betrothed to jo Joseph, was married to Joseph, or was engaged, whose occupation as a carpenter has made him the patron saint of working men. However, the Gospels of Matthew and Luke are at, at pains to make the point that he is also a descendant of the house of David. As his son, then Christ 
is from Israel's royal line, yet he's, he is anything but a kingly birth. And uh, the baby was attended not by great Jewish dignitary, but by shepherds from the surrounding hillside. That's why uh, there's always a saying that uh, a prophet is not without honor in your own hometown. Just as a proof that Jesus was uh, not honored in his own hometown, but the three Magi's, you know, the three kings who are initiated masters came from, I think, partly North Africa, Egypt, and other places that offered the frankincense, the mirror, and the gold as an honoring to him as a Messiah. So that's the sign that even these uh, three magu ma magicians or masters had come to witness his birth uh, as prophesied. And at the same time, not the dignitaries of the Jewish Empire at that time or the Roman Empire had greeted him, but these three advanced beings, the three kings with crowns, you know, more advanced beings. And at that time, I think I would expect that one from Egypt, one from North Africa, and one from the area, the three kings. That's why the three kings are very important components of Christianity because they're the one who offered Jesus. Uh, it's like presented the honor to him. Offering gold, frankincense, and myrrh. At that time, those are very precious uh, material. <clears throat> okay, I, I think uh, we had we had uh, talked a little bit about the history governing the area because uh, most of us who are not Christians here, I think you need to know a little bit the background where the birth occurred and what was happening at that time. So. That area, Judea, was ruled by the Roman Empire. It's a territory, and they put their own governors, they put their own rulers. And at that time, that area was like a stimulated territory, the Romans. Now, with all these commotions and all these kinds of talks and history, I'd like more to talk uh, a few more minutes about the esoteric significance, which is probably the most important part of our talk today. See, Jesus as an avatar of the sixth ray, Piscean sixth ray, is uh, the master and the Lord responsible to bring the right interpretation of the sixth ray devotion and abstract idealism. Now, abstract idealism of the sixth ray in terms of Christianity, in terms of uh, <clears throat> his mission, is about love with forgiveness and love through sacrifice. That's why most of the saints and most of the great uh, martyrs that followed him were the apostles who were beheaded, who were hanged, who were tortured to profess their faith. So it's a symbol of uh, loyalty to your faith. Because at that time, there was no loyalty. Loyalty to the Rome or loyalty to Syria, loyalty to Persia. So there should be a loyalty to one king, which is... Uh, a holy master Jesus, who was representing not the kingdom of the Jews, but the kingdom of heaven, so, or the fifth kingdom, the kingdom of souls, the kingdom of the masters. So since he is the representative of the Christ and the holy hierarchy, to bring that Piscean and the racist idealism of love through forgiveness, love through sacrifice, he has to be tortured and, uh, I would say, betrayed and also as an example of what we had undertaken this era of Pisces, more than 2,000 years of Pisces. That all the legendary people were people who had been sacrificed, assassinated like Mahatma Gandhi is an example of that. Martin Luther King is an example of that. Nelson Mandela is an example of being persecuted. Mother Teresa as a savior for the poor. That's why there's always something that talks about blessed the poor for they will see God. But I think they should include the poor in spirit. Like, you know, the lowly ones, not just the poor people. <clears throat> All right, now, in terms of bringing a path to humanity during Pisces, uh, Jesus' job as an avatar is not just by love. I think his greatest 
his greatest uh, accomplishment if we only see in the higher level of the esoteric uh, science and psychology is he demonstrated the complete initiation of a pilgrim, a normal person, to become the Christ or to reach the initiation of the Christ, seven initiation. That's why in my books, I always talk about the initiations of humanity in terms of the Christian language, because it is only through the Christian language that I've seen completeness and conciseness and succinct uh, line of path from a normal person born into Christhood. Most of the stories of Hinduism, Buddhism, they did not specify the different, uh, I would say, uh, landmarks where a human being can evolve into different levels in one path of just 33 years. Even the life of Lord Buddha did not focus a lot on his initiation on the seventh, sixth, fifth initiations. It was more on the initiation in Bihar under the Bodhi tree that he got his fourth initiation, which is equivalent to Jesus' crucifixion. It is only Christianity that I see in most religions that has a certain path that is so clear. And having the Christian faith declared that Jesus said, I am the way, the light, and the truth. Nobody goes to the Father. Nobody goes to that high level of fathership or godliness without through him or his examples as a soul in a path of initiation. So though uh, ascension is very important, which is the, set, the sixth initiation before Christhood, the birth of Jesus is an example of the birth of the Christs or the soul within you. As uh, St. Paul said, your Christ within is the hope of your glory. So for non-Christians, there's a, a phrase in the Bible that says, St. Paul, which is one of the great initiates, said, that the Christ within you, the Christ, the soul, which is the Christ, the Buddha, in, in, in Buddhism, in Hinduism, the Buddha, or the higher knowledge and wisdom in you, is the path where you will go through the spirit, the monad. Without passing through the soul's life, as a saint or initiate, you cannot go even to the monadic life, which is the Father in heaven in you. So we have to do it more esoterically to understand that. Your spirit is the God within, the Father within, which is like the highest part in you. The soul is symbolized by Buddha and Christ within, which is the hope of our glory to be salvaged. So it's not really the Christ saving everyone's day-to-day -day affairs that would save you from not being killed in an assassination, that saves you not to be kidnapped. It is the Christ's principle at the soul level, the wisdom principle also, that saves the personality and the ego to dispel darkness, to dispel ignorance, to dispel obsolescence, to dispel all the sins of humanity. Because when you bring the soul's light, which is the birth of the Christ principle, the wisdom and love aspect, down to the personality, to the mind, the mind becomes enlightened. When you bring the Christ principle, the soul principle to the emotions, the emotions become generous and benevolent and altruistic. When you bring the atomic energy, which is the Christ principle at the soul, to the etheric and physical body, the physical body will be transfigured into a saint level, as Jesus had demonstrated in his third initiation, called transfiguration. When he was seen as dazzling bright by his two disciples, that they almost blinded their clairvoyance, so that brightness, and that's the third initiation, that is when your atomic energy comes down to the etheric that initiates your energy field to become so bright like you are, look at millions of suns, brightness. So, I will repeat, the birth of the Christ in a, in a human being signifies the first initiation. When the soul of an individual human being started to be awakened, and as the first time the descent of the Holy Spirit, as symbolized by the apostles after Jesus died, they were terrified, they were hiding they were escaping the Romans because they were looking for the Jesus followers. So they were so terrified that they didn't have the will. They don't have the wisdom. They don't have the intelligence to teach what Jesus taught. So it's only after the Pentecostal light, which is the descent of the will of the soul, 
initiated them to be more courageous, to be more intelligent. That's why when you have the descent of the Holy Spirit, you started to become intelligent or illuminated to say the right things with wisdom. And it's only the time that you are more uh, energized, more powerful, to be able to be used as a service instrument to talk, to teach, to serve, and, and to heal. And that is called their first initiation. The birth of the Christ in you, when your heart started to be activated by the light of the soul. If you are a Ray 2, Ray 6, it's easier to bring the buddhic energy through your egoic center. To bring your heart energy into blossoming effects where you start to be selfless, unconditional, and be concerned about helping people. That is first initiation. Whereas second initiation is when you descend the Holy Spirit again to stimulate your mind, to be able to be creative, to be able to be strategic, to be able to think forward, to see the world's needs so you can serve not only with a loving heart, but an intelligent mind. That's why even uh, Lord D.K. has always mentioned that service is the spontaneous outflow of a loving heart guided by an intelligent mind. It's not just a heart. So you start to serve more when you are in the second initiation when the heart is guided by intelligence, not just heart, fanatical and foolish and no discernment what to do, but with an intelligence using the heart to serve. That's the time you become a second initiate. So if you look at Jesus' example of his birth, that is one of the most important initiation of normal human beings. That's why I say religions, religions such as Christianity, and other religions are very, very important for the mainstream. You cannot replace it because that's the time it teaches you how to have fear of God, fear of stealing, fear of doing bad things, fear of doing uh, uh, negative things called sins. Because through the mainstream humanity, religion can be taught because that is their level to learn what is to be done to be a civilized human being. As you become more advanced, you need to be cultured human being, not just civilized. So religions in all entirety has been designed by the avatars of religions to be a philosophy to teach human beings to be civilized human beings. So religion has a very big place in mainstream humanity, in normal humanity with no initiations. So the birth of Jesus was a very significant time where salvation is possible when we have a path, a curriculum. Before that, there was not much path in mainstream humanity. There's an example of how people would live in certain levels where you have initiations possible until you ascend. So talking about first initiation, the birth of Christ's principle, because the word Christ has two connotations. The Christ as a transcendent avatar. And the Christ as a principle of love, wisdom, kindness, and gentleness. So the birth of that aspect in you when you are in a personality development is called the first initiation. And this is the time that even the apostles was given the first initiation during the descent of that fire called Pentecostal fire, which is symbolized by a lot of artists as the dove, which brings peace the white dove on top of the apostles and the tongue of fire and the light that comes down. So any person on earth that has descended the Christ principle has already a tendency when you bring it to the heart as a first initiate candidate. Until you perform a functional service of unconditional love, then you become a first initiate functional. A junior disciple of that. Now, when you see again the story of the Bible, the, the beings or the creatures who are in the stable, in the manger when Jesus was born, are not wild animals. They were lamb, they were sheep, they were meek animals. So the symbol, symbology of this is when a person has the first initiation, they become gentle and meek. Meaning to say, gentle at heart. Not, not, ag not aggressive, not fighting, not, not... See, it's hard to attract people towards you if you are very combative if you're so critically minded and, and attacking people. So your heart has to be gentle as the birth of Jesus symbolized by the birth through a normal, humble beginning, but with meek animals around, no aggressiveness, nothing else, and simplicity. So at a certain level, 
As you go to a first level initiation, you start to become simple also. You know, not complicated. You have so much glamour, so much what you are is always in your head, your degrees, your wealth, your, your education, your social status. At first initiation, you're starting to swallow those things and be more gentle in who you are, not what you are. So one of the requirements of second initiation, first initiation also is to master yourself in terms of meekness, humility, humbleness, and, and not what you are that's important, but who you are inside that needs to serve and help. So that is a characteristic of a first initiator. The pride that you used to commit started to lay low and you started to be more gentle, more simple, more straightforward about how you can serve them. Now, the second initiation is the baptism. Again, in the Bible story, aside from Christmas, we have John the Baptist, who was a cousin of Jesus, a relative of Jesus, was born of Elizabeth, remember? Elizabeth was a childless lady, and during the visitation of Mary, after Gabriel, Archangel, had notified Mary that she is the mother of uh, Messiah, and then also her, her relative, Elizabeth, will bring, uh, bring forth a child, John the Baptist. So now, John the Baptist, as they grow older, was in charge of baptizing people with water in the River Jordan. So he was baptizing all people to convert them as it is the end of the world also. Behold, change your lives because, it, you know, we will have a catastrophe. We'll have... We will perish if you do not change. That's why today, a lot of the other Christians who are more like uh, very, uh, I would say, converting kind, they go to houses and preach the Bible, say, convert now before you die, before you go to hell, before the Armageddon will come, before the... So during that time, the chains of uh, the era of the millennium was also happening as a mini judgment day. A lot of wars, a lot of catastrophes. And many things. So John the Baptist being a preacher, that's why Baptist church are preachers in nature. They convert people to become born again by baptism of water and fire. And John the Baptist baptized Jesus as part of the uh, ritual. And that is the second initiation symbology of being baptized with your emotions, meaning water, emotions, Pisces were all related. Water in Pisces is purification through water. So even Jesus being the son of God at that time, Messiah, had humbled down to be baptized with water by John the Baptist, his cousin. And this is where the Catholic Church had declared that, Behold, this is my only son, my begotten son, of whom you have to adore. This is where a lot of the question mark happened. When you declare this is the only son of God, this is where now separation happens. When you declare that Jesus is the only Son of God and no other avatars are the Son of God, this is where the separation started. I don't think the word only has been pronounced. This is my Son, my begotten Son, where all you have to bring your salvation. Or Not the word only, but when you include the only, that is where the separation of religion happens. Because you will claim that nobody else, no, not Buddha, not Muhammad, no, nobody else is uh, an avatar. So that second initiation in humanity is when you baptize your emotions with a lot of emotional purification. When you go to initiations as a disciple and aspirant, your emotions are the greatest challenge of you to go to second initiation. If you cannot clean your emotions, your attachment, your, your emotional upheavals in life, relationship issues, if you cannot purify those, it's hard to be in a second initiation where wisdom dominates your astral body where wisdom started to become more your guiding spirit and principle. Wisdom does not separate you a lot. When you have still a lot of separativeness, a lot of condescending attitude, a lot of emotional upheavals, a lot of emotional aggressiveness, the second initiation is not totally complete or not really there yet. So second initiation requires emotional purification. And somebody also said in the Bible, that Jesus will not just come to baptize you with water, but baptize you with fire and spirit. Where John baptized with water, Jesus was sent to baptize you with fire. Kundalini fire 
and spirit, soul energy. So when you mix that, it's called alchemy. And when you give that to a person, there's an initiation of second level up. So you can see that a lot of, uh, for non-Christians, you would know that one of the major sacrament and ritual in Christianity is baptism. Whether the Baptists, Jehovah, or Catholics, they baptize the children with water and prayers to make them aware that they are now becoming a Christian and purifying Satan and all the sins of the flesh, which you inherit from past lives that came with you. So the godfathers who will stand by the baby, if you are still baby, the babies, uh, they will renounce Satan, all his work, all his negativity. So it, it's like purifying them with energy, with prayer and the water to baptism and anointment with oil. That's why they put like oil in the fountain of the baby, solar plex and so forth. So there's chakras also involved, but they do not talk about chakras in Christianity. And then third initiation is the transfiguration of Jesus when two of his disciples saw him as a brilliant, dazzling light. They almost got blinded by the light, but it's not physical light. But see, did they not mention about the aura in the Bible? So it's the energetic brightness and blinding light that brought the atmic energy to the disciple Jesus at the time being the path himself, a student to an initiate. So the brilliant light, dazzling light, the first time that the atomic energy physicalized empirically. And that is third initiation, transfiguration. That's why in the third initiation called transfiguration, you totally transform into a saint. Where your soul, your soul has already fecundated much of your personality. Not totally yet, but most of it. So you become a saintly person with a whole, more holy attitude and values. During the time of Pisces, the holiness is attributed to piousness. You know, that quietness, solitary moments, recluseness, and being a monk. That's why most people in the Piscean era, whether it's Hindu, Buddhist, Christians, they tend to become contemplative monks as they evolve. Because they pray a lot, they meditate a lot. And even Jesus had always withdrawn from his busy, his busy activity, healing and teaching people to recluse to the desert, sometimes 40 days, 40 nights. As Buddha also, before initiation, had 40 days, 40 nights of fasting and meditation. It's just similar. So there must be a significance of that 14 number for contemplation. Now, when Jesus was already a third initiate, he had started to teach a lot. This is the time he's become more like public teaching. Because as a third initiate, you become an advanced teacher with more wisdom, with more knowledge about things that most people will not know. A real third initiate. Not just canonized third initiate, because some canonized third initiates are not third initiates transfigured. They were saintly, but not saints at the third level. But Jesus' transfiguration is a total sainthood, third initiation, where he had become a teacher, a healer of men, and become the shepherd of the flock. So you have to be, be careful when they heard shepherd. Jesus is not a physical farm shepherd. He was a shepherd of the flock, meaning humanity. He was not shepherd of lambs. So you have to see the continuity of shepherd of people. Because at that time, shepherds are like the common thing that any avatar will use as a teaching metaphor. Fishermen, that's why he's a fisher of men of men also, souls. And at the same time, on one side, he's a shepherd of men. And the son of carpenter. So see, what I just don't like is they emphasize the son of carpenter as a very lowly uh, uh, label. And they did not focus on the kingly royalness of Jesus as the descendant of King David through Joseph. So from his birth, he was a kingly royal already by blood. But they did not focus a lot on that in the Bible, on the New Testament. But by history, he is. Okay. Now, the fourth initiation is where the fourth initiation by total renunciation. As Buddhists say, it's total renunciation. It is where you renounce your total personality and your ego to become above the ego, which symbolized by Buddhism as Buddha sitting on the lotus. 
because that lotus is symbolized as the buddhi, the buddhic chakra. The chakra at the love wisdom intuitive plane, when you're above that, you're already effort initiate. You can sit above the lotus, it's not under the lotus where you are below the egoic center. You are totally fort initiate arhat or a total uh, a first level master at that level. So in the Piscean era, Jesus has to die in the cross because it's a symbol where you die from your personality. That you can surrender your personality and that is because you don't need it anymore. As I have taught you in esoteric uh, science that a fourth initiate is somebody whose causal body have died. Whose causal body is not needed anymore so that content of 100% total filled up causal body diffuses that essence of many, many hundreds of lives towards the higher soul and monad. And therefore it dies. So now you are not obliged to come back again in the Piscean epoch to incarnate again because the Piscean six-ray uh, idealism is abstraction. Meaning after you finish fourth initiation, you don't have to incarnate again because you are abstracted. You're like that. Which is probably totally different with the Aquine because you need to reincarnate to serve in terms of duty and to join again the ranks of masters and the entourage of Christ to come back and physicalize heaven on earth. Externalization of the hierarchy and the reference of the Christ are related topics. It's not just one being coming back. It's an entourage of holy beings that has to physicalize that one life. And that's the time the Christ's second coming, as they say, has to come because that's the time the earth wants the beings to physicalize. Therefore, you glide in the surf physicalization or externalization or involutionary tide to have heaven manifests on earth. It's not just the flesh. Jesus manifesting as human being is the whole entourage of the Christ and the hierarchy coming in. Not the whole, most of them. All right, so fourth initiation is the crucifixion in Christianity. In Buddhism, it's called total, total renunciation. And after you crucify your, your personality with the heavenly principles, that's why if you look, the upper chakras should override the lower principles of the lower chakras. Now, the fifth initiation is demonstrated by Jesus through resurrection from the dead. Or you will resurrect from the death of your castle body. You resurrect at the monadic level. So you are not living now on personality, mind down. You'll be looking at being resurrected at the higher manas, higher mind, buddhi, atma as your personality at that time. That includes your personality, not anymore your soul. So your soul dies as part of the personality, because causal body dies with it. And then you now have a higher self called the monad. It changed the, the game. After your fourth initiation, you don't have a soul independently. It's your soul is becoming your own personality. You are a living soul at that time. So Jesus was the example of a living soul on the crucifixion level, conquering the personality totally. In Piscean, you don't need to be alive after reaching that because the abstraction of idealism is part of the game of the Piscean epoch to abstract. So most fourth initiates gurus, they die during the fourth initiation. They leave their bodies. That's what that's the real meaning of Mahasamadhi. is the absolute or the latest or the last samadhi or the last death because you don't have to come back. But they called Mahasamadhi to anybody who died, which is not true. It's Maha is... is Above. So it's above that energy that usually lets you die. All right, now the res resurrection is an important component because that is the fifth initiation. The fifth initiation is very important because that is where you start to live as a holy master. A Maharishi. Rishi is fourth initiate. The total rishis that are rishis in India are fourth initiate. The Maharishi is the fifth initiate or the adept, adept of wisdom or the holy master, the, the master of wisdom, fifth initiate. Then after fifth initiation, Jesus to the Christ's initiation had been ascended 
is not the drawing of uh, the Roman painters that is levitating physically. That is only a demonstration where you don't have the concept of energy and consciousness ascending through consciousness. So fifth initiation is followed by ascension of Jesus. And this is very important because the ascension is the, not the levitation physically, is the ascension to the monad, consciousness. So the sixth initiate is somebody who is a holy master who has already physicalized consciousness on the monadic level, whose adi is active, the absolute self. So fifth initiation is followed by ascension of Christ consciousness. So the Christ consciousness of the soul is not anymore in the buddhi level. It will ascend to the monadic level, that's ascension. So anybody who has brought the Kundalini and awareness from buddhi or from Atma buddhi or the soul to monadic level is an ascended master of the sixth level, which is in esoteric parlance called the initiation of decision. And a Christ is somebody who has already taken the Adi as part of the Kundalini. 49 layers of awakening. That is a Christ completely, a perfected human being. Because when you perfect yourself as human being, it is when, or, or when you have perfected yourself as a human being, as the absolute graduation of the planet, is when you have already brought the Kundalini to Adi, and master the 49 layers of consciousness and 49 layers of Kundalini awakening. That is already Christhood. Seven initiate the perfected human being. And Christ it was said to be the first who had perfected that. With the globe. Buddha was ahead, but Buddha does not belong in the same uh, history line as, as, as Christ and humanity. is another uh, root phrase. So we have to be careful when you say ahead of humanity. What kind of humanity? What root race? And what globe? This globe, mm -hmm. like that's why you have studied a quantum invocation book. Because uh, Lord Buddha and Lord Christ are said to be, have taken initiation of third level in this planet together during the Atlantean time. Because that is the first offering of the third initiation during this globe. And Buddha did not take it because there's no initiation at the time, except when the Christ and him had to take the third initiation. That's why like they are brothers in the, in the path. Okay, so you see that the significance is, is different from... Just merely celebrating Christmas with goodies and, and freebies and all kinds of celebration. You need to see the significance of birth of Christ within and the ultimate development of the seven initiation. So therefore, we can conclude that Jesus and the Christ has declared totally correct that I am the path, the way, and I am the light, the way, and the truth. Nobody goes to the Father you cannot achieve the Lord Sanat Kumar's presence because the Lord Sanat Kumar's presence is at the Shambhala. He is like the divine father of the planet. Nobody can go to the level of Shambhalic presence of Lord Sanat Kumar without going to the seven initiations, like the, or six and a half to seven initiation. That is one interpretation. Second interpretation is, I am the way, the light, and the truth. Nobody goes to the Father except through me. You cannot go to a monadic level because the monad is, is like your father in heaven. You cannot go to that level of life, monadic life, without going first to become a soul life, which is the Christ principle. Therefore, the coming of the Christ again is not just the physical Christ coming physically. It has to be first preceded by the Christ principle, the soul of everyone fecundating the personality for even the energy of the personality being receptive to the new Christ energy. What would Christ teach us or teach humanity if they don't even believe there's a crown chakra and there's a soul totally? What would he teach us an advanced subject? It's already a lot of subjects taught earlier. Until now, love one another kind of thing is still not being followed. So I, I would today declare that in, in the world religions, one of the most important 
today as teachings of Christianity is not about Christmas only. It's about Christhood and ascension, resurrection, and crucifixion. Not crucifixion. Crucifixion is the fourth level. <clears throat> the ascension must be the focus of Christianity because it's the triumph of the monad over the personality. Not only the triumph of the soul over personality, which is crucifixion. So the passion of Jesus in the cross is a stepping stone for them to see the ascension and the Christhood of Jesus the Christ. And so Christianity is one of the most important religion that can demonstrate is if understood and when understood by the teachings, not only from the Bible, but the real teachings of esoteric Christianity. I'm not superseding any teachings of Christianity or Catholicism. I'm not putting my crown of being an interpreter of that religion, of this religion, but I'm just giving you some light that gives you a little bit the esoteric significance of Christmas as the first rung towards more initiations or the seven initiations. And the real first initiation in the hierarchical realm is the third. So if you read books that say first initiation, it's not always the first initiation, it's the third initiation of the threshold. Meaning to say, the threshold being the hierarchy line, the third initiation is the first of the threshold. The secondary, second and first are not important as far as hierarchy is concerned, it's the first, it's the third initiation. So when you read books, you have to be careful interpreting that uh, a first initiate is a saint. No, that is the threshold, which is the third initiate. Which is the first time that you become a member, full-time member of the hierarchy. is the third initiation. Otherwise, second and first are only affiliates members or junior members. Affiliate members is not permanently inside the hierarchical line. It's below the threshold. So Christmas, uh, to me, is a very important time that Christianity was born in the sense of the true Christian spirit of initiations. And Jesus was the forerunner of deploying this as one of the examples of a short-lived life of 33 years, as they say, six a cycle. 33 years is six cycle. So six cycle, Jesus, six ray, Lord, and Piscean time, six ray energy is a very important. That's why it's 666. When you see it, in, I think it's the... Antichrist. So to have to, to fight the Christ, you have to have an Antichrist 666, something like that. Six cycle, six ray, and six ray Pisces substance. So a corresponding 666 from the other side will also have to have the 666. Okay. Anyway, I will close uh, today with the blessings and it will take a few minutes to bless our friends, our relatives, our loved ones so that we will channel the true spirit of Christmas as the first significant initiation of humanity, a demonstration of the Christ principle dawning and physicalizing, fertilizing our consciousness today. And I know that gifts are very important, but the gift of Christmas through initiation is very, very important when humanity will have its first initiation. That is a true Christmas. Or at least majority of humanity will be first initiates. And it will not be too far, I think, before the Christ will come in physically and with his entourage, the holy masters, that first initiation of hierarchy has to be accomplished. And that's why we are very busy doing a lot of things today, teaching healing, teaching the chakras, teaching the kundalini, teaching the soul, teaching the nature of initiation, because that is a school of initiation where humanity has to learn to be even thinking of first initiation. If these teachings, the science of centers and chakras, the science of colors, the science of the soul, the science of kundalini, the science of alchemy, the science of healing and so forth, will be taught to mainstream humanity in schools, humanity will have a first initiation. So our work today is not just to teach healing and be paid for your healing uh, works. It is really to spread not only the acquiring invocation as a mission to declare the new era as John Baptist has been declaring also that a new era is coming. Be born again or something like that. It's also a transition where new life tools, new spiritual tools has to be awarded to mainstream humanity so that there will be a new tool, not only normal religion, but meta-religion or metaphysics or meta 
techniques so that the first initiation in Mass will be celebrated by humanity, and that is the birth of Christ's principle, which precedes the reappearance of the Christ. I don't think the Christ and the Holy Masses would have any of it used if mainstream humanity will not even have first initiation. We want Jesus, or, or we want Christ to come in, we want the Holy Mass to come in, but what would they do in your neighborhood if people do not even know that there's an aura? If people don't even know there's a chakra? If people don't even know what else beyond the physical body? Even scientists still proclaiming the brain as the mind. And the most intelligent people are still do not believe that there is an energy field and there's a soul. They're still questioning that. How far are we yet? So Christmas has to be part of the spread of Christ's principle, Buddha principle, or love, wisdom principle, to bring the energy to humanity. That's why today we need to bring that wisdom of the soul as the Christ principle, not only the gentleness of the first initiate, the meekness or the gentleness, because in Pisces, meekness is a virtue, yeah. not intelligence, not will. But you have to understand that that's why the meekness of the lamb and the goats, the sheep that around Jesus' birth, is a symbol of the old first initiation, the birth of the Christ principle. This time you put love and gentleness with intelligence. Because the love has to be accompanied with intelligence to be used it properly. So even emotional intelligence has to be mastered by humanity to be able to generate that first initiation via the heart center, forehead and crown. I hope today you have a better understanding about the birth of even Christianity and Christmas. Because Christmas is really the birth of Christianity. So if you want to understand Christianity, you need to understand Christmas first. And to graduate from Christianity, you need to understand Ascension and Christhood. And the esoteric levels. So today I promise you esoteric significance of Christmas. I have delivered to you maybe old information, new information, or in between. So I hope you have a very good Christmas, a happy new year also. So please celebrate in your own local areas what you feel is appropriate for your group. And again, Merry Christmas to all and uh, I wish you all the best. And hopefully from today, you will be an agent of Christmas in a different level, esoterically speaking. And you don't have to be a Christian to be uh, a real Christian. The real Christian is the one who embodies the Christ principle of love, generosity, benevolence, service-orientedness, and gentleness, and also the ability to share to others your life as far as you, you can and as deep as you can. All right, good luck to everyone. Have a joyous holidays. And again, have a nice time.